Calvary wins again. Well, I'm sure glad I came to church tonight. Man, my heart's been encouraged already. I'm glad you came to church tonight. If you have your Bibles, open the book of Colossians, if you would, please. We began a study in the book of Colossians, an overview. We've been there and working through it. Colossians chapter number one. If you look at the next few verses in the book of Colossians, you'll notice, like I mentioned earlier, the Goliath, the life-size Goliath, is still up on the wall. And this morning we looked at the sermon, what happens when your giants look appear or look too big. And uh, that's, that is a real size, a real um, two size, two scale size of Goliath, nine foot six inches tall. That is a ten foot piece of uh, paper there, nine foot six they printed for us. So if you want to get a picture with them afterward, you've not yet, go get a picture and you can compare what a real size Goliath looks like. Now I imagine he probably was a little bit wider, his shoulders could have been wider, right? Maybe thought that, who knows? Uh, maybe he was slim, maybe he was just as wide as he was tall. Maybe he was like a big square. We don't know that. But he was big, but God brings us through through the giants of life. And we'll all have giants we'll face at different times. But tonight, look at the book of Colossians. Again, thanks for singing so well. Encouraging to hear a church sing in praise and worship of the Lord. And I hope your heart was encouraged like my heart was encouraged. Um, boy, I just, um, I'm glad we have a church that sings. All right, we don't have to manufacture it, don't have, have to manipulate it, don't have to throw some smoke and lights and all that stuff up. We can just sing songs that please the Lord and worship of the Lord and, and have authentic worship, worship that comes from the inside to the outside. God, you've done this in my heart, and I want to sing about it. And you're singing so well, worshiping so well tonight. I do want to mention briefly that a guest with us, Brother Abraham, and I'm going to slaughter his last name, but I'm going to try it one more time. Can I try it one more time, Brother Abraham? All right, I, I believe it is pronounced Olo Runlowo. Did I get it? Did I actually get it? Or are you just saying that to make me feel better? I got it. See, choir, you doubted me. I practiced that. And I, I want to introduce him. He is, he is um, talking to one of our young ladies. I introduced them in that way because churches, churches have a way of talking. All right, you're sitting over there looking and, and appearing. You're not going to focus on anything else in the service tonight if I don't say something about that. So let me just say on there. So put your Facebook away. All right. No more Facebook. Don't look at me like I don't know what you do. Oh, is this, oh, look Oh, look at that. Status changed in a relationship. Look at that. And here we're in the book of Colossians, and you're on Facebook, or you're on Instagram, or something else, all right? So put it away. We can now look at the Word of God and got that out of the way, right? Okay, everyone's duly embarrassed. I did ask if I could announce them, and they, and they you know, I didn't just throw that out there, though. Though I would, you know, but I didn't. I, I asked first. So Colossians chapter 1, as we continue the word of God, uh, let's begin in verse number 3 where Paul is talking to the church of Colossae, a church that, that I believe he now is presenting the thought that the preeminent idea ought to be Jesus Christ. Fits into our theme this year of only God, you'll see on either, on either wall and behind me as well, only God. And Colossians, we could say the theme of Colossians is only Jesus Ephesians, as Paul wrote Ephesians, I would submit that he's presenting Christ as the head of the church, and Colossians, Christ is the head of you and the head of me. That in all things he might have the preeminence, the first place. We're not very far into the book yet, but in, book, in, in chapter 1, verse number 3, where Paul says to the church of Colossae, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Just a little note right there. Often in Paul's epistles, he mentions praying for the church and for the members of the church. I imagine Paul had a lot of people to pray for. You don't think that Paul just said those things, do you? You think he actually did that? Yes or no? You think he actually prayed if he said he's praying for them? It's inspiration of God's word. Of course he did. The Bible's true. Of course he's praying for them. But what a great example for you and for me. So don't, don't ever think it's too overwhelming to pray for the folks in this church. You ought to be praying for them. Paul was praying for all the Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians, those churches and, and, and many other churches, praying for them. As we ought to be doing for each other. And I'm so glad to be part of a prayer-oriented church where someone says, I'm praying for you, and they mean it. Not just a nice platitude. And I hope you pray for each other. So many needs in this church. Where Paul says, I'm praying always for you. Verse number four, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. 
We looked at these two uh, concepts about three weeks ago or so where Paul was first of all encouraged. He said, we give thanks to God for you. I'm encouraged when I see what you're doing, when I hear about what you're doing, when I am made aware of the way that the gospel has come to fruition in your life. I'm encouraged by that. Listen, as you walk with God, you will encourage other people. And you may not even realize it. You may not know the impact you have. And I'm talking from young people to old people and, and you young, you young children in this room. As you walk with God, you encourage the adults around you. You say, well, I'm only six years old. I'm only 16 years old. Listen, as you walk with God, as you're sensitive to God, you will encourage other Christians. I'm reminded again of that story that was told to me by a man who was here. He came through our Reformers Unanimous program. He was, uh, uh, for a brief amount of time, cleaning as a janitor at the church. It was one day that there was uh, two young men in high school at the time who I guess, as I'm told the story, either making fun of this man or, or some, some way, shape, or form. Apparently the Lord touched one of their hearts, or both of their hearts, and one of the young men went back to this man who, was, who had come through the program and who was now working a little bit, cleaning around the church, and he apologized to this adult. A teenager apologized to an adult. And he said, the Lord touched my heart and and I, I need to apologize to you. And there was adult's testimony that he got right with God. And his testimony was, when I saw that a young person could follow the spirit of the Lord, I had to ask myself the question along these lines, why can't I listen to God as well? And that young person was Brother Cody Copeland's. Now a wonderful, tremendous teacher in our school. I appreciate his influence here. Listen, young person, you can encourage someone else by your walk of faith. Grandma, grandpa, old, young, single, married, doesn't matter. As you walk with God, you can encourage others. And Paul says, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, I'm thankful for you. He continues on, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have to all the saints. He talks about not only how it's encouraging, but that it was evident. Remember that Jesus said this, that the mark of distinction for a Christian, the mark of a disciple of Jesus Christ, the badge, all right, the discerning characteristic of a Christian would not be the size of their Bible or the check sheet of their church attendance or the length of a tie, hair, or anything else, except that Jesus said, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Not just even love toward the unsaved, but love toward fellow Christians. The mark of a, of a, of a disciple that Jesus said was a marker, a marker was a love for other people who are saved. Sometimes in the house of God, the people of God... Act like enemies. Bitterness, strife, envy, jealousy. Well, why does Brother Dalton get to sing the solos? I have a good voice too. Well, why did the Lord bless them with a, a new house? Why did they get the new car? Why did they get the promotion? Why do they have this? Why do that? The, the, the bitterness and envy and strife and the gossip. And Jesus said this, and Paul commends them for not only the encouraging walk, but the evident walk. They were different. They were different because of Jesus Christ. Hey, they were not just following a list, I'm going to love my neighbor today, and so I'm going to say hello. No, no, no. They just let what was on the inside come out. Not the inside flesh, but the love of Jesus Christ. When that love comes out, the fruit of the Spirit begins with love. He said it was evident. Continue in verse number 5, our text, 5 and 6 for tonight. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God and truth. Lord, I thank you for this time. Lord, I pray that you would help me to explain and, and, and Lord, bring those things that would be a help to us tonight from your word. 
Lord, would you challenge us? Lord, would you convict us? And Lord, would you change us tonight to be more like your son, Jesus Christ? Lord, you're faithful in your calling of us, but you're faithful in your working in us. Lord, may we be good soil. May our hearts be tuned to your frequency. May we receive the truth tonight. Lord, would you touch us? In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. I want to give us two other aspects of this introduction to Colossians. Two other, if I can, characteristics of these Christians that I believe are characteristics that we ought to have here, not only at First Baptist Church, but any church that, that are true believers or any believer that is a true believer of Jesus Christ. Now listen, my friend, have you been touched by the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you accepted him as your savior and believe that he died on the cross, was buried, and rose again? If you've done that, no matter whether you're old or young, then something ought to be different in your life. Something ought to be different because of Jesus in your life. And that's what Paul is going through in these few verses. He said, listen, you've been touched by Jesus. You've been touched by the gospel. And there are some characteristics. I want to give you the next one tonight in verse number 5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. You see, a characteristic of a Christian is a Christian that ought to be a person that will be expectant. Or oh, they'll be expecting something. The word here in the scripture is the hope. Now we use this word expectant usually in the context of moms. Do we not? This lady is expecting. Well, expecting what, pastor? Well, expecting her husband to take care of her, that's for sure. Expecting him to drive to get food anytime she wants it. We'll even say, well, we'll have all the expectant mothers. Well, when a lady's expecting a baby, what is she looking forward to? A baby, thank you. Thank you. It was uh, our first child, and we uh, went to that class. Uh, what is that class called? They teach you how to breathe? Uh, to, to breathe? It, it, um, oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was Chinese torture. Uh, I'm sorry. We're sitting there and uh, introducing our, the ladies are introducing the men. That's how they do that in that particular class. And the ladies are, you know, like, oh, hello, my name is Sally and this is Jim. And, and we're having a little girl and we're due in. They're coming around. I said, honey, I said, I'll take care of this. She should have known. I said, I'm, my name is J.D. Howell. This is my wife, Doreen. And we're having what we hope is a baby. We don't know. It could be a heifer. We're not sure. I said, I'm here because my wife dragged me here and said, get over, get, get out of here, or get out of the house and come with me. I asked her, that's what I said, did I, honey? And, uh, oh my goodness, and all the, all the women are gasping like you gasp. All the men were cheering me on until their wives saw them, then they hit them. All right, uh, don't you cheer that on. And my wife is embarrassed and red, of course, and uh, boy, kind of, you know, bombed the class right then. Of course we're having a baby, right? Of course we're having a baby. We're expecting something. Oh, some of you, when my wife was pregnant, decided to enlighten Doreen to the pains of labor. Thank you for that. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. Oh, let me tell you a story, Doreen. Let me tell you how bad it was. Listen, just on a side note, church, don't do that. Don't do that. All right, just, just stop. Just stop, all right? They'll figure it out just fine. If you have some helpful tips... All right, some help to them, that's fine. But don't go in there and just say, listen, oh, I was in labor for 14 years. They always grow, don't they? How big was your baby? Oh, my baby was 45 pounds. Nine feet, six inches tall, six cubits in a span. Named him Goliath. Barely survived. And I had triplets. You know these. You've heard, listen, how many have heard these stories at church before? Come on now. All right, and these ladies, oh, I'm going to have a baby. But you know what? They're expecting a baby. They're expecting a joy, a bundle of joy, a bundle of energy. And my goodness, when this little one comes, what a blessing it is. The Bible says they're a heritage of the Lord. What a blessing it is for our kids. And we're blessed with, these, with, with three children. And it's a blessing, expectant. The Bible says that because we're saved, because we've trusted Jesus Christ, there is a hope which is laid up in heaven for you and for me. You know one way that we ought to be different? We ought to be hopeful.
hopeful people, not hopeless people. Christians ought to be the most hopeful people. But it seems sometimes that Christians are just as defeated and just as hopeless and whine just as much as everybody else. My friend, if Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, if he was buried and rose again, and if you have accepted that gift, then my friend, you have a reason to have hope in your life. That's why Paul could be in prison. He could be in jail and begin to sing a song because he had hope. And one day I'm going to find out what song Paul sang. I wonder if he's saying I'm on the winning side. It wasn't written yet. Okay, I'll help you there. I don't think he, I don't think he sang a song, you know, nobody likes me, everybody hates me. I think I'll go eat worms. You've heard that song before, right? I don't think that's what Paul and Silas sang. Do you? I don't know what he sang, but I bet it was good. I know it was powerful because, oh my goodness, all of a sudden the doors start to rumble. The ground starts to rumble. The doors burst right open. We have hope. We ought to be the most hopeful people. Hope that is authentic. This is real hope. This is not just a, oh, I'm hoping it will happen. This is not just some power thinking. No, this is hope. Because of Jesus Christ and what he did. Let's reject the defeatist attitude because of Jesus Christ. Let's replace cynicism with God honoring, Christ uplifting hope. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Really? Yeah. I'm his, he is mine. I have Jesus. And right now, there may be a giant, but it's okay. It's okay because I have hope. I have hope that because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I have hope because I am on the winning side. You see, there's a characteristic of Christians, an expectation, an expectant idea, an attitude. The Bible says there that this hope, which is laid up for you in heaven, there is a reservation for you in heaven, a thing with your name on it, laid up for you. It is for you. No one can take it away. Nothing can snatch it away. This is a guaranteed hope. Not only is it authentic hope, but it is anticipated. It is coming. May not come tonight. You may drive home in the same beat up old car. You may arrive to the same stack of bills. You may go to sleep in the same lumpy bed. My friend, just remember, this world is not, help me, my home. I'm just passing through. If I can, I'm just on a trip. I'm just on a trip. So if sometimes the hotel accommodations aren't what I want them to be, that's okay because I'm just passing through. We'll only be here a few more days, a few more nights, a little more time, and then we're with Jesus forever and forever and forever. This is a hope that we ought to have, and it ought to be evident in your life and in my life because of Jesus. See, because of the gospel, we ought to be different. So when you go to work, your coworkers ought to think, boy, what is that kook job singing about now? Why is he still singing? Why is she still singing? How can she be so happy? How can he be so happy? You know why? Because of Jesus. Not because I'm like, well, I'm just going to choose to be better. I don't care what you choose. I'm just going to decide to think positively. Well, la-di-da. How about we decide to think about Jesus Christ? Because of his work, because of his love, we can have an expectation, an expectant hope, a hope that is authentic, a hope that is anticipated. A man approached a little league baseball game one afternoon. The score was 18 to nothing. And he asked the little boy he was losing, Why aren't you discouraged? The little boy said, Nope, not yet. He said, Why not? The little boy said, Well, why should I be discouraged? We have me, I haven't even been up to bat yet. <laughs> why should we be discouraged? We haven't even been up to bat yet. man found himself in the middle of a pasture. 
being chased by an angry bull. The bull was gaining on him rapidly, but he saw up in front of him the only form of escape, a tree branch that was 10 feet in the air. And he leaped for it. And he missed it. He missed it on the way up, but he caught it back on the way down. You know what hope causes you to do, hope in Jesus Christ? It causes you to leap buildings in a single bound. Superman has nothing on a Christian empowered by the gospel. Nothing can harm you. Nothing can stop you with the power of God in your life. Ten feet, ten feet, it's nothing. Christian, have to have hope. Not only do I have to have hope, if it's real hope, it'll show on the outside. I've met Christians with hope. And I've met Christians who seem to have no hope. Which one would you rather be around? Which one would you rather be around? The woe is me or the woe is he? Which one would you rather be around? I know which one I'd rather be around. You talk to me about what God is doing. Talk to me about what God has done. Talk to me about how you can still have a smile on your face and a spring in your step when life seems bad, not because you've chosen differently, but because God is good. We have Jesus sent to us to give us hope. Not only do we have hope, one more aspect and characteristic tonight. In verse number six, found in verse number six. Not only was this gospel an expectant gospel, but tonight it was effective gospel. Look in verse number six, if you would, please. Which has come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit. The gospel is not just here for us to enjoy it. The gospel is here so that we can accept it and then give it. Tremendous, excellent messages last Sunday in our, for our soul winning conference Friday and Saturday and Sunday with Brother David Wood here. Apple trees have apples. If it's a healthy tree, if it's a good tree, if it's still planted in the ground, orange trees, what do they bring? Oranges. See, I didn't tell you they were going to test tonight, did I? Rabbits have bunnies. Lots of them. Rabbits have bunnies. Rabbits don't have horses. Rabbits have bunnies. Humans have children. Right? Christians have Christians. You see, we know how it works out here. Apple trees, orange trees, rabbits, humans. But here... Christians have Christians. Your call and my call is to reproduce. To give the gospel so that someone else knows what we know. Someone else hears what we heard. So that someone else can believe on Jesus like we believed on Jesus. What does life with Jesus look like? It looks like a difference. So that we're seeking, we're trying, we're doing our best with the grace of God and the power of God to give the gospel to every creature. The Bible here says you've heard this as they've heard in all the world. Again, the Bible does not speak in hyperbole or exaggerate. I believe when the Bible says that all the world heard the gospel, that the Bible means all the world heard the gospel. I take the Bible at face value. Can I get an amen on that? as you ought to as well. And our job is not over. Our task is not finished. Jesus said the one thing to pray for is not th that, that more would be saved, but that more laborers would go forth into the field. He said the harvest truly is plenteous. It's great, but the laborers are few. Who are the laborers? 
you and me. Christians, not only do we have a hope, but we're supposed to be in the field with the idea that we will bring forth other Christians. Oh, not in the way we just convinced them, not in the manipulation of our mind, but in the power of the gospel. Listen, they will not hear. How can they hear without a preacher? How will they hear unless you tell them there are people that I will know that that you will never know. There are people that you will know that I will never know. But they can all know the gospel when we take the personal responsibility. We take the personal challenge to see that the gospel reproduces that I'm not saved just for me. I'm not saved just to come to a nice church and sit with some nice other Christians and I'm thankful for all that. But I'm saved so that other people who don't know Jesus Christ can be introduced to Jesus Christ so that other people who have no hope can have some hope. So other people who have no purpose can have purpose. So that other people who need to see the power of God in their life get to see the power of God in their life. My friend, we have the greatest gift ever. There is no greater gift. There is no greater news. There is no greater truth that God, than that God loved you and me and sent Jesus to die for us. And beyond that, opens the door to a life of fulfillment and joy and hope and happiness and purpose. We've seen it here at First Baptist Church. We've seen homes put back together again and lives healed and addictions broken and attitudes crushed and children called to service and parents changed by the power of the gospel. Once angry, now kind. Once cruel, and now compassionate. This is the power of the gospel. This is what the world needs and we have it. So don't just sit at home. And enjoy your Christianity. Don't just come to church and have a nice time. Come to church and have a nice time. Sit at home and enjoy your Christianity. But don't for a moment think that your job is done. The Bible uses this word, we're ambassadors. We're ambassadors. We introduce. We build a bridge people to come to Jesus Christ. It begins with kindness in the gospel. It carries through by carrying tracks in your pocket. It has a power found in prayer as we diligently seek God's face and understand that every appointment is a divine appointment. Every conversation is no accident in God's economy. Who knows that this is the one opportunity that the person will have to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You may think it's just a tract. It's just a word about the gospel. But you don't know, as the Bible says, that you're not laying the seed, the groundwork for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is supposed to be effective. We are called to reproduce. Ultimately, the gospel of Jesus Christ calls us to be different. And if I can, in this application, not just different than those who don't know Jesus. Because obviously we're supposed to be different than that. But can I submit that really, tonight, the gospel of Jesus ought to bring a difference, really, from a lot of Christians that I've met, unfortunately. Can I just say it that way? Christians who don't have hope, but they ought to have hope. Christians who, for lack of a better way to describe it, just have a stinking, rotten, no good, filthy attitude about life. And because of Jesus, ought to have a good attitude about life. It ought to be different. Christians who have the gospel but don't want to share it. We're called to be different. My challenge for us tonight is can we be different? We leave this place different, not just because we decide to be. Not because we found three reasons to be different, but because Jesus Christ is inside of us. His spirit empowering us, enabling us. Because of the power of Jesus Christ, it shows up on the outside.
a spring in our step, a song on our lips, and the gospel before us. Are you different tonight, Christian? Are you different? Are you different because of Jesus Christ? Lord, I'd ask you to help us tonight. Lord, you've called us. You've saved us. Lord, because of the power of the gospel, I want to be different. Lord, my prayer for this church is to be different. Lord, that we're faithful as we give the gospel to everyone we meet. Oh God, would you touch us? Lord, touch the conversations that we have. Guide us to those appointments that we, we can miss, Lord. Lord, would you change our attitudes? Lord, because of you we have hope. Because of Jesus.